We still, you know, the United States still has a presence, a military presence there. And he said, I don't know what to do with my, my daughter. It's, it's making me crazy. I said, what's that? She's joining the armed forces because she wants to go to the Mideast to serve over there. I said, what, is she going to be in the medical? No. She's a marksman. First off, she's a woman. But, I mean, and so he asked for special prayer back then. And I, if I said the name, some of you might remember because we asked for prayer here, the, here from this platform. So we prayed for his daughter. And I'm happy to say that as of a month ago, but, eh, is this still October? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so it's still this month. Then. So this month, I'm happy to tell you that she finished her tour of duty and she's home safe. The point is, though, here, okay, so she was going into battle. She was going into harm's way. She's going to where there's a rumor of war. I mean, there's, there's, there's always an un something unsettled somewhere in the world, amen? amen? But let me ask you this. Where can you go where you're not in harm's way? What did I just say? I was in the church yesterday. Hello. <laughs> Are you okay? <laughs> My pride was hurt. I still feel a little bit of, yeah. <laughs> but where can you go to get away from harm? Job 5, 7 says this. He reminds us that a man is born for trouble and surely as sparks fly towards the heaven. And so I see no way to deny that statement that we are troubled people living on a troubled planet. And because we live in a fallen world, Nothing seems to work the way it should. Sin has stained every part of our physical universe, and sin has deeply infected the human bloodstream. It's in the blood. Things break. Our bodies wear out. We grow old and we die. People kill each other. Marriages break up. Children get hooked on drugs and alcohol and sex, sometimes all three. Babies are born with defects that can't be corrected. Our leaders disappoint us. Our friends turn into enemies. One day we're going to wake up to find out that we've been sued by a former colleague. Or the boss decides that you're just not the right fit for a job that you've worked at for 30 years. <coughs> years ago, I, a, a, a brother in the church we were at, years ago, I can say that because it's been many years. We were sitting, kind of like we do now, around the round table for the kids, you know, we, we were sitting there and we were dunking donuts and coffee and I can't remember exactly what we were talking about. But one of the guys was, was sharing something he was going through and he said to him, Brother, when hard times come, you need to be a student rather than a victim. Now that's, that has stuck with me. It wasn't directed at me, but I received it in Jesus' name, amen? When hard times come, you need to be a student rather than a victim. I mean, and that's good advice. A victim says, why is this happening to me? While the student says, okay, what can I learn from this? I mean, these are difficult days in, in most parts of the world, and I believe that hard times are coming to Christians who live in this part of the world, in the Western world, in the United States. Hard times are coming. Some say, well, they're already here. Well, yeah, to some they are. That's why we need to actually, let's just, we, we need to rise up in our faith. Lifting up those feeble hands that hang down, we're lifting them up, we're praising God. We need to know how to survive and, and, as, as our culture, both close and our neighbors, turn against us as Christians. That is why we might should maybe study this particular book. And that's why we need to look at this because, I, I, first off, it's a nice short read. It's only five chapters. So you're not really big on reading long books. There you go. But it's a good handbook for hard times. Though it is the earliest of all the testaments written in the book, it was written in A.D. 38, maybe to 44, and it reads like a letter. That letter, if you read it, is kind of like a letter to the 21st century church. And here's what we need to know about the book. First off, let's look at the author. His name is what? James. Trick question, right? And who was James? Anybody know? Evidently, he was what? 
Jesus' brother. Actually, he was a half brother. But he was, yeah. Brother. Also Thank called you. James the Just. Okay. Thank you. So, that, but that means though he was biologically Jesus and Mary's son, and we know that he wrote very early because the book addressed at the very beginning. You'll see that the book addresses the twelve tribes. As a matter of fact, let me bring that up here. James chapter one verses one through four. James, a bondservant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, to the what? Twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Now, I want you to understand this is a historical fact, so it tells you, gives you a, a time frame of when it happened. This is when the, the tribes of Israel, this is when the Christians were scattered. Amen? My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but watch this. Let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. <laughs> you see, those early Christians were Jewish. They were scattered. They were poor. They were struggling, not just in their faith, but in life in general. And get this. Their brothers... Their friends, their neighbors, remember what I, they, listen, they were against them because they had left their faith, the Jewish faith. Today we would say, well, maybe that's not quite so. How many know Jesus was a Jew? That's a whole other message, that's a whole other study. But in many ways, this little letter of James is probably one of the most practical testaments, practical books in the whole Bible, because it reads like a sermon, or perhaps maybe it reads more like a pep talk that a coach might give to a team. I like that. When we read this epistle, we get a glimpse of Christianity in its earliest form. There's no theory here. It's all practical. It's something that you can apply. It's something that you can put into, fall, into uh, to use in your life. Just straight talk from the brother of Jesus about what works and what doesn't work in the Christian life. And some of you may be more familiar with this book than others. Someone has, uh, as I was reading a commentary, they said that they're, they, they counted more than 50 commands in five chapters. Kind of like Paul, uh, when he wrote in, in, in his books, which is most of the New Testament, uh, it, was, you know, it, was, it was intricate theological arguments. But this is a cut to the chase. This is bottom line. This is, this is, watch this. This is where the rubber meets the road, amen? Here's the bottom line talk from a man who knew his readers, and he knew his readers needed encouragement, and, and, and he knew that they needed to stand strong in hard times. I'm here today as your brother, as your sister. I may be pastor. I may be your preacher. I'm, but I'm also someone who wants to come by today and encourage you because I know every one of us here, you're going through hard times, and if you're not, you're going to. Amen. So here's what we see. James, he begins this exhortation <coughs> about how to respond in hard times. And interesting to me is after 2,000 years, what's this? Um, some things change. Some things stay the same. Amen? Amen? So I break this thing down, and I'm just looking at these four verses. And God spoke so loudly through these verses. In the first verse, we see this. Here's the command. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds. Consider it pure joy. He begins by reminding us that sooner or later, probably sooner, we're going to face trials of different types. Various problems are going to arise. And the word face has the idea of, of falling or stumbling over a problem. I mean, picture someone... Driving, if you can, picture someone driving down the highway there. It, it's on a Saturday, right? Maybe like yesterday, clear skies, kind of cool. But he's in his, he's in, he's, he's there and he's in his convertible. Can anybody, can anybody identify that? Sitting in his convertible, I don't know, maybe it was an old Cutlass or something. Or, or maybe it was like a 1960-something Firebird. Cruising down the highway, just having a great time and just enjoying the scenery. Wind blowing in his hair and then boom, something, he, something happens. There's a big thud, and the car pulls hard to the right, and he goes off the shoulder, and he can't go anymore. He was so caught up and enjoying himself, he didn't see the pothole. Can you say, good feeling gone? Turned out, a beautiful day turned into a bad day. Now, that's pretty lightweight, but still, <laughs> the, 